It seems um, a little cliche, but I feel like I, I fell in love with photography and the magic of photography when I really got my first camera, which was a Polaroid given to me by my grandfather when I was six years old. I'm not a fly on the wall type of photographer. Photography is about engaging in the world, with the world, with the people whom I'm photographing. I learned about Montgomery County, Georgia because a friend of mine who worked at Spin Magazine, which is a publication I worked for, um, called me and said, I just received a letter from a student at Montgomery County High School, and it was really a cry for help. She said, please come to my town. Um, we're having segregated proms and I can't take my boyfriend to the prom because he's black and I'm white. Please come tell the story. The prom, the segregated prom had just passed. The, the young girl, Anna, who wrote the letter said she boycotted the prom. We got in touch with her and she said, actually, the next segregated event at the school was homecoming. So we went down in 2002 to photograph and document the segregated homecomings where they literally had a ballot that said white queen and black queen. I kept returning to photograph and, and the, I, the best way that I could photograph like the overt racism was the actual segregated proms, which were obviously a symptom of something larger, but, um, for years, I was, I was photographing and interviewing the children, the, the students, and some of the parents um, in the graduating classes um, and really asking the questions of why is this still going on? How is this still going on? And then in 2009, the New York Times Magazine published the photo essay and the multimedia story. And that's when it was brought to national attention that they were still having segregated proms. Because there was ma national outrage from the proms being segregated, the school was forced to integrate the proms the next year. And I knew I needed to be there. So I wasn't exactly welcomed into town, um, especially by a lot of the white families who were very angry that I was exposing something that they thought was really none of my business. I worked pretty hard that year without a camera, but just going down to the community and talking to a lot of school faculty, family members, and I was voted to be allowed to attend and photograph and film the first integrated prom in 2010. In 2011, there was a tragedy that happened in the town. And one of the young girls who I'd been photographing for many years, Kiki Burns, um, her high school boyfriend, Justin Patterson, was shot and killed by an older white man in the community. Suddenly, everything changed. So Justin Patterson's murder, it was, um, it was awful and um, the Patterson family I had gotten to know throughout the years of me photographing the proms. On one hand, you know, there were people who thought there was progress because this murder even made it into the courts. They thought this was progress that it was even reported on, <laughs> which was crazy to me. But I knew that the project, the most important thing was really following this case and to see if the family would get justice. So much is based on trust and relationships. So there's so many people who I've become very close with over the years um, and I continue to photograph them. Now I'm continuing to photograph their children and I just went back to prom. It was amazing because prom queen of Naisha, who's prom queen in 2009, who is photographed in the show, she's there's prom queen 2009, then I photographed her in 2011 with her two children, and just now, this past prom, I just photographed her son going to the prom. It's just amazing to go back and see generations growing and seeing lives unfold. Naisha, I'll, I'll never forget, she, you know, she said, look, we, we take one step forward and two steps back here. So in some ways, you know, Progress is happening, um, change is happening, it's slow, and there's a lot more work to do. There's a lot more to overcome, but it's happening. One of the other important aspects of organizing this show was really 
amplifying the voices of the subjects she was photographing, that it was crucial that they tell their stories in their own words, that Jillian as a white presenting photographer and me as a white presenting curator are telling the stories of African-American adolescents and young adults who are grappling with this legacy of segregation. And so it was really important that it's their story told in their voices. And so the text, the, the labels, are quotes from the students, both at the time that the photographs were taken when they were teenagers, and again, we went back several years later when they were young adults. And I think this body of work is a great example of visual activism and photography affecting social change. What's been so fulfilling about having this exhibition travel throughout the country is that different, you know, this is not just an anomaly that this happened somewhere in the South. This is happening in all different communi communities. You know, racism manifests itself in all different ugly ways all throughout our country. So um, it was fascinating and, and, in, and amazing to see the community engage with it in Portland, Oregon in Madison, Wisconsin, um, in Atlanta, where this is happening in their own backyard, and now in Rochester. So what is exciting is how different communities engage with this and are open to this conversation. Because really, you know, I, I fundamentally believe in art being able to make change. And I believe that art is a, is a vehicle to engage in conversation and conversation is really where change begins. So that's kind of, so that's really the hope with Southern Rights is that people, it, it enables people to really engage with difficult and um, complicated conversations that it's not just a Southern story, this is, this is an American story.